So, welcome back, everybody, to Gray Matters. Welcome to Gray Matters. Name kind of rolls off the tongue. I, I like it. The more we say it, the more I like it. So, Rob, what do you want to talk about? Huh. I Well, there's a lot of different topics we can talk about, and we're staying on our theme of multiple sclerosis for MS. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to talk about spasticity? Yes, I do. It comes up a ton. We spend a lot of time managing it. And I think sometimes patients don't know they have it. So I think maybe getting more insight into it would be good. Let's do it. All right. Um, So what? Yeah. A good way to start is what is spasticity? What is spasticity, Dr. Jeans? So the way I describe it to patients is muscles that are activated when they don't intend them to be activated. And this isn't something that happens to all muscles equally, some muscles more than others. And so when you tighten muscles in different patterns, it can pull you in different ways. So as an example, you know, sometimes people will get charley horses or cramps in the calves, or maybe their toes will get stuck, cramped, and the toes will pull in different directions. And that's one way that spasticity can manifest in patients. Um, Other things that we might see sometimes is a sense of tension or aching or cramping. Um, And what I'll tell patients is it's sort of, it's in part resisting movement. It's sucking up the energy and energy is not limitless in MS. So it is an important symptom to identify and treat because it can preserve energy and you need that energy for other things in a day. One of the the things I think is fascinating uh, and one of the things that, shocks people when I I say it to them, patients or people that know much about MS and what it can do or have seen MS cause things to them, is that MS doesn't cause weakness. And that's a weird thing to hear because certainly we can see people that have, you know, need a walker or a wheelchair or something because they can't support themselves in their legs and things. So we see weakness, but MS doesn't cause weakness primarily. MS causes spasticity, Mm -hmm. which leads to weakness so the this get, get sciencey for me I rob i love, love getting science i know you do so the brain kind of works backwards from the way that you would think so you would think that if you need to reach your hand out to grab something that your brain sends a signal in some pathway from point a to point b to tell the muscles in your arms to move in a certain way to turn them on in a certain certain uh, order that's not what it does it does the opposite of that. What it does is it sends a signal to selectively shut off the muscles that should not be active when you're making a movement. And that might seem like a potato or potato thing, but it really, it really sort of illustrates why things like multiple sclerosis or really any problem in the, in the brain or mm-hmm. spine um, in the central nervous system cause can cause spasticity because if you are unable to shut muscles off and you try to reach out to grab a cup, you are fighting all of your muscles along that way. You're, you're fighting yourself. So you can't put the brakes on the muscles that you need to put the brakes on. Can't put the brakes on. And, and you're having to work extra hard. And that makes whatever you're doing mm-hmm. much, much harder to do. So it makes the load higher. And what happens to someone who has something that becomes very difficult to do? They stop doing it. Mm-hmm. If you If every time you try to lift your leg and you're fighting a ton of bricks because you can't get those muscles to relax, you're, you're, you're going to stop trying to lift your leg. And when that happens, then the muscles start to atrophy and then people can start to get weakness. And then it becomes a snowball because it becomes weaker. The muscles tighten up, harder to lift, less movement, more weakness, muscles tighten up. So it, the spasticity thing is a, Big, big deal. It's it's really Mm -hmm. central to um, much of the dysfunction that people can have from MS. And this is true, by the way, of other conditions. So when you affect the brain with anything that causes a problem, so you say a stroke in an area or Mm -hmm. a tumor Mm -hmm. or a lesion from MS, it can cause the same symptoms. We would see this spasticity um, in the same area regardless of what the thing was that caused the damage in that spot. I think that speaks to this being a brain thing and not just an MS thing. Yes. You know, when you, when you interrupt those break messages, those 
stop messages and everything's go and tight, yep. that's what you'll see. Yeah. Um, I always tell the med students um, that anytime I ask them a question, if they answer with the term disinhibition, they're going to be right 95% of the time in the brain <laughs> because that's what the brain does. That's what happens with your nervous system. You get you get reflexes that are built in to make the muscles do certain things, and then you get a level of control above them. That level of control, if it gets, uh, gets damaged by something, now the reflexes will fire on their own. It, I think about it like uh, a dog walker walking a bunch of dogs. If someone throws a bone out in front of them and the dog walker's doing their job, those dogs won't, won't, won't get off the leash and charge. But if that dog walker can't do it, if there's been an MS lesion that's affected that person and someone throws a bone out there, those dogs are gone. Mm -hmm. And that makes it much, much harder to do whatever you're trying to do. Now, we, we see this in arms. We see this in legs. People can get rib spasms. Um, it's not always something that patients mention, though. Are there things patients would say that are buzzwords to you that maybe they're having spasticity and don't realize it? Yes, although it, it kind of depends on where the spasticity is. Yeah. Um, so if anytime somebody is having a, a functional motor problem, that is, they can't, their muscles cannot meet the effort of whatever that is. So lifting a jug of milk is a load mm -hmm. on your muscle. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a load that for most people you can do it, but... If that load increases, if you're either holding a giant barrel of milk or your muscles are fighting yourself when you're trying to lift that, that means you can't do that load. You can't, mm -hmm. you have a problem with that. So that's the first thing that I would, would see. The, when that happens to somebody, some patients will experience that and other patients won't. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is that you'll have some patients that feel that tightness. They can say it feels like it's in yep. a vice. Yep. It feels tight. It feels cramped. It's yep. uncomfortable. I can't sleep. And then for some reason, there are some patients that can have that. You can see the muscle tightness when you look at them, but they say, well, it doesn't really bother me. I don't, I don't really yeah. notice it. I've had some who you can really feel it when you try to move yeah. them around and they, they may not have noticed. Yeah. So it's interesting how some people are more in tune to noticing it and some you know, don't. Yeah, or, or that it's just for whatever reason, their 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 signals that that tell their brain that are not working, which yeah. is also something that MS can do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but the spasticity becomes a big problem. It leads to the weakness. It leads yeah. to discomfort. It leads to inability to uh, sleep. It leads to all kinds of problems. Yeah, even self care. You know, if if your legs are tight and it's hard to get in and out of the shower, or yeah. if it's hard to make a meal. Um, you know, it really can be a barrier to to all the things you need to do in a day. I another thing that I'm always talking to med students about is that I, I love neurology because it's in the end of the day it's kind of easy. It, that is, the brain works in certain ways. It, it works by inhibiting things like what we talked about causing the spasticity, and it does that everywhere. But it might look different. So you might have someone that has spasticity in their arm, which means that you get that chicken wing appearance. You get mm -hmm. flexion of the hand, the Kinda hand curled clamps up, tight. up, their arm cl bends closer to their chest. And that's because when all the muscles st start to tighten up, the more powerful muscles will take over and you'll get the, in the flexors of the arms, they will win against the ones that extend your arms. In the legs, it's mm -hmm. the opposite. So the extensors of the legs, the, the legs sticking straight out are more, sh are stronger than the flexors of the leg. So you'll see that, but you'll also see it in other ways that are more subtle mm -hmm. like when people are talking and have difficulty getting their words out mm -hmm. we call that a dysarthria we say mm -hmm. that it's it's um a problem with the mechanics of speech but very specifically we can tell that that's a spastic dysarthria mm -hmm. because it, they're not able to make they're not able to relax their throat enough to comfortably make sounds and we can hear it. We can hear when someone yep. s starts talking to us that, oh. We, yeah. we sort of know that where a problem might be Yeah. Uh, based on that. I agree. Or uh, spastic bladder. Yep. You know, the bladder is a muscle, and that can get spastic and, and give you that sense of urge, and i got to go right this second without warning. Um, 
yeah, I mean, any any muscle, yeah. I guess, really could be involved. Yeah, and it, it, it might seem like it's very different. I mean, you know, this person's having a speaking problem. This per- person is having a bladder problem. This person can't lift their leg. But it really kind of shares underlying principles, which is those muscles aren't sharp enough. Yeah, and, and really also makes treatment somewhat straightforward mm-hmm. because we, we sort of have our arsenal that we use – regardless of where that spasticity is. There might be extra options here and there based on what muscle, but but there's a lot of overlap with the meds we do use based on where that spasticity in the body is. So a natural option um, that sometimes I'll start with for patients is a little bit of magnesium. So sometimes patients want to start natural and they don't want anything prescription and magnesium can have antispastic properties, can be sometimes very helpful for that leg cramping at night. Um, so that's one of my sort of gentle starting points. Uh, but for significant spasticity, if it's something that's interfering with quality of life, if I can feel it on exam, generally I'm moving more towards prescription strength treatments. Uh, I'll, I'll also add, uh, so all, all Puritans listening, close your ears. Weed. Oh, yeah. Marijuana is a pretty decent antispasmodic. Um, I guess I, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't roll that into prescription, but it is sort of. It's it's not just taking a vitamin yet, but. Yeah. I guess that's in between. Yeah, that, yeah, I'll have to figure out where in my head I put that. It depends on where people are listening on whether it's a prescription (laughs) or not. (laughs) Here in Michigan, you can get it at the Kentucky Fried Chicken, so. But I think you get better prices and better access with a card. So I do. Uh, uh, yeah, I still prescribe it for people. So I, I will do so. the card for people. So in that way, I guess I sort of think of it as prescription if there's a card. But yeah, I'll have to reframe how I think about that. We're getting off topic. We're yep, gonna, we'll sorry. probably do a whole My bad. discussion on weed at some point because it's an interesting thing from a brain standpoint. Um, I will say, though, that I do have patients that use that. And mm-hmm. they um, are consistent users because it has had value. Yeah. You know, I think it definitely took some trial and error. Yeah. Uh, but I do have some regular users who have benefit from that. Yeah. Going from a prescription standpoint, um, and maybe starting with some of the pill options, do you have some that you like to use, some that you don't like to use? What do you do in a day? Yeah, so um, so muscle relaxers is kind of a broad category uh, that we, we utilize, and there's there's a lot of them. Um, they all work in sort of different ways. So if if you look at a muscle under a microscope and watch how it's firing and watch all the steps that takes a muscle to fire, you can interrupt that in a lot of different ways. And there are a variety of different things that we can do where people take a pill Mm -hmm. and that helps relax muscles. The problem with all of them is that when they relax a muscle, they relax all your muscles. Yes. And that, that we're, we're then sort of shooting for a target where we don't, cause people to have too much muscle weakness, but we're getting rid of that muscle tightness uh, and that, that can take some fine tuning. I think the other thing too is sometimes those medicines have to be dosed multiple times a day Mm -hmm. and pill fatigue is a real problem where someone will look at the handful of pills and be like, I'm done with all of this. Um, So that sometimes can be an issue. I don't blame them. Have you ever had to uh, like take an antibiotic course? I am terrible. I'm pretty sure I miss the last three days like every time. Don't, don't do that. Take yeah, your antibiotics as directed. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm terrible. Yeah, me too. Um, also, sedation. Sometimes when the med is taken by mouth and absorbed, you can get some sedation with muscle relaxants. Yep. And and go ahead. Yeah, the, it, they might get relaxed muscles, but if you're asleep and you can't do whatever you need yeah. to do, then it's not really Yeah, helping. it's sort of not exactly what we're hoping to achieve. But there are also sometimes ways to administer those medicines intrathecally, which is a fancy way of saying into the spinal fluid. And that can be a good way to treat without having to take a bunch of medication by mouth. It may sound extreme, but when you're a good candidate, you're a good candidate and it it can work very well. It's also super cool. It's very interesting. So cool. Yeah. Um, My favorite, I have gotten so increasingly um, excited about spasticity treatment Botox. Oh, I love Botox. I like, so in training, I did not have access to Botox. Um, The neuropathy people did all the Botox. And I thought it was this mystical, magical thing. And then I got here and I was having to have other people do my Botox. And they said, you're going to have to learn this. I have my own patients to treat. And I'm like, I'm allowed. (laughs) You'll train me. 
And it has just been the best part of one of the best parts of my journey to, to be able to offer this service. It is magic sometimes. So for our, for our listeners though, um, yeah, sorry, most up. of you might be very confused because when we, when Jean said coat, but Botox, you heard, wait, real housewives. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the thing that people spend $500 to inject into their face so that yes. they have fewer wrinkles? And the answer is yes. However, the dermatologist stole it from us. Mm-hmm. Neurologists have been using Botox for decades mm-hmm. because Botox, uh, is a very, very, very potent muscle relaxer. The name Botox uh, is, a, is a short form of saying botulinum toxin, um, which is the thing that causes botulism. It is one of the most potent and one of the most deadly substances known to man. It's something where I've heard at one point that a teaspoonful of botulinum toxin was enough to kill a stadium full of people that you're really making it sound good no 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 no. (laughs) (laughs) however (laughs) however that actually that part actually makes me feel better because the formulation that's used is a local formulation that a lot that means the botox can only stay in one place and we know that it can only stay in one place because it's so deadly because botox has been around for decades if there was even a one in 10 million chance that mm-hmm. it got into your bloodstream and killed you. We didn't know. We didn't know about it. I think that's also why I love it so much is you have complete control over where it goes. Exactly. When you take a med by mouth and I, I'm not hating on meds by mouth, but you lose some of that in the, in the metabolism through the liver yep. and it has effects in other places with Botox. It is where I am putting it. Exactly. And I can pick and choose the muscle, the placement, the dose and that level of control uh, I'm not a control freak, but that level of control I very much enjoy as I'm treating this symptom. Uh, so when you put hot, so the the other the downside to Botox, yeah. the problem with Botox is it has to be injected. So but it's a t- it's a small needle. It's a very small needle. Super small. Yes. And I will say in general that patients will say yes, it is a poke. I don't love a poke, but. But when it works well, it, works well. it is worth it every time. The second treatment of Botox yes. is really easy for people. The first oh, treatment yeah. is they're sweating. Yeah, the first treatment they're tense. They're 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 afraid, and yeah, it can sting to to have the the shots done. But um, but once people re- recognize how much improvement they've had after the procedure, mm-hmm. they are thrilled to come back and do it again. And I'll say at least half actually want a higher dose because we don't start with a maximal dose. Right. We start on the low end. Um, and we just, you know, we watch carefully and we adjust as we go. And I will say once patients go through that first cycle and the cycle is like you you do the injection and it works for about three months and then you come back for your next cycle. Usually they're starting, now that they know what it can do, they'll say, hey, what about this area? Or can we go up on this dose? And patients really, I think, once they see the benefit, can start to listen to their body and figure out where else placing it might be helpful. Yep. The, a, a good example of a Botox that, that uh, we use a lot, or I use this a lot, is uh, for spasticity in the hand. So if you tighten all the muscles in your forearm up, your hand is going to clench shut because mm-hmm. the, the flexor muscles in the hand are very strong and the muscles that extend your fingers are relatively weak. So if they're all firing, you're going to clench your fingers your hand into a fist and this can get to the point where people's nails will dig into their hands and cause infections and cause downstream problems. So, um, Botox then becomes the muscle, uh, uh, injections, several injections into the muscles that clench your fist, the muscles that muscles that close your hand. And if we weaken those up enough, then we can get things back into balance Mm -hmm. where the, uh, the, the extensor muscles can start to work and people can get that hand open. And what I always tell people, when we do that is there's two steps to this. Step one is we'll put the Botox in um, and figure out what dose works best for you. Step two is for you, when the Botox is working, mm-hmm. to start to exercise the opposite muscles. So in this case, start to retrain and re-strengthen the, the muscles that open your hand so that when the Botox wears off, which yep. it eventually will, they have a little bit more strength in the, the opposing muscle to, to start to move the snowball in the other direction. I, when they do, when patients are doing Botox and they're in PT or OT, sometimes too, I love when I get feedback from the therapist, like, oh, I was able to move them in different positions yes. or stretch them much more. 
Um, Because it, you know, sometimes the changes in that way, and that may not directly change an ability to stand and make a bowl of cereal, but just that range of motion and being able to, you know, move your body as much as possible is great. Now, my, you said, hand arm is one of your favorite my favorite is the foot i really? love treating toe cramping i i do it really? works so good yeah where people will get their feet kind of either walking on the uh, wrong part of the toe or the big toes pulling up or the you know the toes are splayed out for some reason i'm always like i have just the thing for that and it works so good so you're a foot person such a foot person <laughs> i am i am that's well. That's a, that is it. We're, I think uh, I know you well enough to know that you're a whatever you need to do to help somebody person. Oh my gosh, hundred percent. And just to to give our listeners a little more uh, information, when we do Botox here, we have machines that help us listen and help us locate the right muscle. Because you might say their skin. How the heck do you know what muscle you're going into? And sometimes you can feel it, and it's obvious, and you can see it across the room. Yep. But sometimes it's a smaller muscle or it's more subtle. Um, and so we use these machines that help us listen to the muscles and sometimes even stimulate those muscles to make sure we're in the right muscles and it's not just a blind guess. Yeah. Um, and then we also sometimes will incorporate ultrasound, not me as much as a zoo, yeah. um, one of our other colleagues, but we'll also incorporate ultrasound to even have pictures to show for the harder to find muscles. We are right where we need to be. Yeah. So. Um, Botox. We're, we're, by the way, Botox, I believe, is a trademark name. It is. So uh, uh, there are other yes. botulinum toxins that are great it's as like, well. It's like Kleenex. I know. It's right? like they are kind of like the Kleenex. You just call of, it Kleenex, yeah. even though it may not be exactly Kleenex. Yeah. Is there, so there are other. Um, I'm just using brand names all over the place. There are <laughs> other bandages <laughs> that are not Band-Aid. But, um, uh, but bot- when, it, when it's treat it, it will last for a short period of time, certain period of time, usually several months. So when people get a treatment, they will need, usually need to have the treatment repeated mm-hmm. every few months or so. Mm-hmm. And j- some people will try to space it. I've never really found that super duper successful. Yeah. People have tried, but usually stick into that three month window seems to give the most benefit. Yeah. Sometimes it's not quite three months. We can't do it more than every three months. Tell me why. It is because uh, your body is brilliant at at everything, and one of the things that it does is it, it can build antibodies to things that you uh, either inject or, or take. So the more frequent you do something, in, in particular Botox, the more the higher chance there is for your body to build up antibodies against the Botox, at which point it becomes useless, so or much less effective. So we we space it out enough to ensure that. Uh, that risk of the antibody formation is pretty low. And where you might have to be a little careful is if you are doing it for cosmetics and the bladder yep. and the limbs and you're kind of different appointments but consistently exposing your body, that might be one time to think about your dosing strategy. Yep. And I forgot, like, the first-line treatment of spasticity, like the first <gasps> thing, even before magnesium. The most important thing. But oh, my gosh. I feel like an idiot now. Stretching. Stretching. So stretching is a sorry, big deal, sorry, stretching. Y'all. I forgot you. You I, matter. The, the physical therapists are rolling their eyes at us, as I they know. should. <laughs> stretching is such a big deal. Yes. And, and it's something that, what I tell my patients, um, you need to do it consistently. You can't stretch on Tuesday and, and see the effect on a Friday. This is something that you, in, in a perfect world, are doing multiple times a day. To, to really give those muscles a chance to um, just be put in a different position, you know, because you're going to compensate and you're going to change how you do things because it's easier. But you got to take that time and really, whether it's comfortable or not, do the stretching. Sometimes I feel like stretching becomes one of those things that doctors or nurses or providers will tell people uh, and they kind of say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you should eat healthy. You should exercise. You should get good sleep. And everybody's like, yeah, 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 I know that. Uh, and stretching is something that people with spasticity, people with MS should do. And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's a and really important thing. all people, thing. too. All people. I mean, if you think about, like, I'm not as limber as I was when I was 20, and maybe if I stretched, I would be. It, it, I, I, uh, when I am functioning well, and which is not all the time, but when I am <laughs> functioning well, I stretching makes a big difference. It, it, it 
makes it so that you can move easier. It makes things you're doing smoother. It's a, it's. Yeah. Please don't underestimate the importance of stretching. Huge. And you may need someone to help you, mm-hmm. or you may need to look into rubber exercise bands or something um, to help you kind of figure out how to stretch certain muscles. But that's where a physical therapist or your physician can hopefully give you some guidance on how to find those different stretches that are best for you. Yeah, if anything, going back to the whole brain working backwards thing, stretching is often more important than strengthening. If you think about it, if you if your problem is primarily spasticity, the tightness of the muscle, and you just strengthen your muscles, mm-hmm. you could be strengthening the spasticity. You'd be making things worse yeah, if that's muscles. all you're doing it. So the stretching part is is a, a thing number one. Yeah. That should have been the first, but we're finishing on a high note. That's right. We planned that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, obviously. Whole time. It's been great as always talking to you, Jeans. I always learn a lot and I appreciate everyone's ears and always good to work with you, Dr. Rob. If uh, anybody has ideas for uh, brain neurology, we've been talking a lot about multiple sclerosis, but if anybody mm-hmm. has ideas um to uh, shows that you want to hear about, information you want to hear about, topics you want to talk about, please feel free to send us an email. We're also accepting logos for Gray Matters. Yes. If you have a great logo ID, idea. Yeah, we'll take logos, we'll take official colors, we'll take slogans. Mm-hmm. Help us out. Yeah. We're neurologists. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah, we are, we are not the... We know our people. skill set. Exactly. Stay in our lanes. <laughs> well, good to talk to you, Rob. Bye, Jeans.